worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who ever more will be. He opened the prison door. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause He hung up on that cross, then He rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise and joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're
wanted perfect, you just wanted my heart. And the story isn't over, if the story isn't good. Failures never find over when the father's in the room. Failures never find over when the father's in the room. so good and I will uh, people have been asking me uh, how Tony Hinojosa is mm -hmm. so I went over and I 
I didn't visit with Tony, but I did with uh, Cindy, his wife, and uh, sister-in-law, and mother, and brother-in-law, and all that. Tony was taking a nap yesterday. Tony is suffering mightily. And uh, because this was such a near-death experience in this garbage truck when he got crushed, that uh, he is suffering from PTSD, and uh, which is post-stress traumatic disorder. And uh, Cindy says he wakes up during the night uh, with nightmares and cold sweats, and and he is just suffering something terrible. So uh, we'll have to continue to keep him in our prayers. And uh, he was in a garbage truck. He, he works for GFL, just in case anybody isn't up to speed here. He's in, and his boss somehow lost track of him, pushed the lever, and he ended up getting crushed. His leg got crushed. And uh, so he uh, is in not good shape. Could have very well killed him. And he could have very well lost his legs, but a lot of prayer. And uh, his leg was able to be saved. So, uh, and now it's recovering and uh, getting back on the mend. On the better note, I was talking with Cindy yesterday, and I was, when I was over there visiting with her, and I told her about cutting the grass, how I wanted to get over here. I, I mowed the grass on Thursday and how we had lost our man because his community service hours were up. And I said I wanted to get over there and get the grass trimmed because I ran out of time when I after I mowed it. And uh, she says, you know what? I know someone who needs to have 100 hours of community service. And I said, hmm, I bet he would like to mow the grass at the church. <laughs> so... I think we have somebody coming forth to mow the grass for at least this summer. He has a hundred hours of community service he needs to get taken care of. God works in mysterious ways. So Amen. I just went over there to Cindy's house on a whim. I didn't even know I was really going to go over there. I knew eventually I would, but uh, it just so happened. And I just praise God every day, every day for putting things in the right path at the right time. So, all right, Pastor, why don't you come on up here? My birthday is not until tomorrow. <laughs> I did mine early. You could do yours early, too. So, huh? Just be thankful we don't spank you. <laughs> What'd you say? You wanted to get spanked. No, I didn't. <laughs> That'd be a lot of swats. <laughs> a, a lot of swats? You know, if we start going down that path, Leona, I guess I know when your birthday is, too. So, <laughs> And I think your swats are more than his. So, If you know how many books are in the Bible, then you know how old I am. Yeah. Mm. How many? How many books are in the Bible? 66. 66 books? I'll have to write that down and remember it. Okay. All right. Well, let's go. Happy birthday to you. Cha cha cha. Happy birthday to you. Cha cha cha. Happy birthday. God bless you. Cha cha cha. Happy birthday to you. All right. You're relieved of your duties. Happy birthday. The real question is how many are in the old and how many are in the new that makes 66? 42. That's for you to find out. I got it wrote down. 42 and... Is it 42 is in one, right? No. In the old? Four, it's 40-something. I know. That's... It, it's 40-something. And 20-something. How's that? I'm pretty close, aren't I? You just nod your head, yes. <laughs> or else I'll just keep rambling. Okay, uh... Since we've had uh, things going on this morning, the joke of the day will have to be put off until next week. Aww. So well, you're just going to have to wait. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Good morning, God. It's us here at Waterford Cathedral. And thank you very much for your presence in our service. And 
Thank you, Father, for the, the, the fun times that we can have. Uh, as poking fun of people and uh, joking around because we know that uh, you want your people to have a good time also in life. And Father, I'm so very appreciative of your love and your guidance and, and giving us wisdom to make the correct decisions. And thank you for your unconditional love when we don't make the correct decisions, Father, that uh, we know that we continually fall short. Father, I also pray that you uh, that you be with uh, Kendra as she's home now from the hospital and uh, be with her. Let her know that you're there for her. Give her husband patience when she's dealing with when he's dealing with her, give the family patients dealing with her and her terrible disease that she has. And Father, also be with uh, Cindy Hennahosa and her family as Tony continues to heal. May you know, Father, that uh, be with uh, Tony and let him know that you're there for him and be with the family. Give them the patience to be able to deal with it. Be with the doctors as they make the decisions on what has to happen. And Cindy also asked me to pray for her grandson who is having an operation, Rico, coming up this week. Uh, should be minor, but nothing's minor And when it comes to surgery. And Father, I pray that you be with him. Uh, Rico is such a good boy, good good young man, and I, I believe he does know you, Father, but, uh, but he does need to pray and be with the family as uh, they do this. Now, Father, as we... Uh, continue on this morning. I also pray that you be with uh, Jason as he continues to sing. May the songs be pleasing to you. May the message that comes out of these songs be grateful and heartfelt. Be with Pastor as he does the message this morning. And, uh, may, may, and thank you, Father, for sending our pastor to us. And Father, I pray that you be with myself as uh, I move into the book of Acts this morning with the kids. And uh, may I be an inspiration in their life. May it be much more peaceful this week than it was last week. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <laughs> I got to remember to unmute myself. Jim said sometimes uh, things don't always happen the way that we think that they're going to happen. Uh, but we always follow the words moving, and uh, this morning, Alyssa came down uh, with, with Pastor and Garina, uh, and she's going to give us our next song. that I wrote when I was 17. Um, it's called Taste the Father is Good. It comes from the verse Psalm 34, 8. Come taste and see that the Lord is good. And I hope that it blesses you. Bye. 
I have felt the precious love of God Cause he said I would Come taste the Father is good Father, come rescue me from all this world Precious love of God, cause he said, Lord, come taste the Father is good, come taste the Father is good, brother and sister to come taste the Father is Father, come wrap us in your arms and we will dance forever with each other. For I have seen miracles done in me. And I have felt the precious love of God cause he said I would. Come taste the Father is good. Come taste the Father is good. Sing. 
Now, I don't mean that you need to do that this morning, but you're free to do that if you felt like that's what you needed to do. But I'm excited about this new series that we're entering into today. Uh, so we uh, just finished up uh, the series that we were in, and we're going to enter into a brand new series today. And I've entitled this series, The Just Shall Walk by Faith. So today we're going to look at some foundational things about why that's true and how that that takes place. And then we're going to begin our march through the book of Romans. So if you want to keep up with where your pastor's at, you need to get into the book of Romans starting uh, next week. And you need to start reading through the book because we're going to start unpacking it as we go. But before we get started, just to say that we're thankful that you're here, whether you're here in person or whether you're watching online with us today, or whether you're going to tune into the recording later this week, we're grateful that we have the opportunity with technology today to share the Word of God with you, and I know and I believe and I trust that the Word of God is able to make changes inside of you and I, and to do His will inside of us if we will receive it by faith, amen? So I'm Darrell, I'm the pastor here at Waterford Baptist Cathedral, and uh, thank you all for your support, and uh, let's pray before we get into the message, and just ask God to be a part of what He has already placed within my heart, amen? Father, thank you for your word, thank you for how you've unpacked it in my heart, and now I ask that you would just form your words in my mouth, and let me speak the words that you would have me to say. And that, Lord, that you would give all of us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying today through the message, and that we might receive it into our hearts by faith so that it might transform us, that it might do in us what only your truth can do. Your truth sets us free. And Lord, there are a lot of things that we still need freedom and deliverance from. We still need to experience victories from in our lives. And so for each and every person, I ask that you would allow that to be true in their lives today, whoever they are, wherever they are this morning, for the honor and the glory of your name. And we give you thanks for it now in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So in this series that we're going to be looking at of how that the just shall live by or walk by faith. Because to me, walking and living is the same thing. If you're not walking with God, you're not truly alive. So to live by faith is to walk by faith, and to walk by faith to me is to be alive. And so I want to show you through the Word of God how that that is absolutely the truth of His Word so that you and I can learn together that to walk by faith is to be alive and to walk with the living Lord. Amen? Mm -hmm. And that then the, His living Word begins to do inside of you and I what He always purposed for it to do before He ever spoke all things into creation. It tells us in His Word that before the foundations of the earth ever were, that His plan was to redeem you and I unto Himself and to make us Christ-like by allowing the life of His Son Jesus Christ to be made alive in both you and I so that we might become, in a sense, little Christ walking around in this world. Do you know that that's what they first called the Christians at Antioch? They weren't known as Christians before that. They were known as those who were in the way. But as soon as uh, they got to Antioch and the Holy Spirit began to move, then the actually the outside community outside of the church as a way of making mockery of the Christians and a way of ridiculing them started saying, you're like little Christ. You just all think that you're just little Christ walking around everywhere. And they said, well, that's not really who we are, but I like that term. We'll take that. We're Christians. Yeah! And we should be just as excited about that today, amen, to say, yes, we are Christians. We are Christ-like in our life. Even though we still fall so short of what He truly is, He's still working on me, He's still working on you. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we see Him, we will be like Him because we will see Him as He is, amen. So we're not a finished work yet, we haven't arrived but good Lord, we're on our way. Amen? Because of the goodness of God, we are on our way. We're walking by faith. We're alive and we're living with God. And He is doing His work in us and through us, 
not only to transform you and I, but to shine a light into the life of everyone else around us so that they too might come out of the darkness and into the glorious light of his truth and his salvation. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to begin with a story uh, that takes us all the way back to the beginning. While we may never get to the book of Romans today, so don't get excited if we never cover any scriptures in Romans. We might cover one, okay? And I am going to cover one passage of scripture in Romans uh, as we get going. And so I'm going to look down at Romans chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. And I'm sorry for the people in the booth that I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but if they can catch up or you'll just hear it, okay? So the key verse to this whole series, the key verse to the whole book of Romans, the key to the whole verse of God's purpose for your life and for my life is found here in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. And the word of God reads like this. For I, say I, I, I am not ashamed, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek or the Gentile. Why? For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written. So Paul is telling us in the book of Romans how that the question that Job asked so many millennial before, how can a man be just with God? And just and righteousness are interchangeable terms. To be just is to be right. To be right is to be just. And they both are accomplished by believing or by faith. Amen? And that's the whole thing that we're looking at and we want to look at as we walk through. So now going back to the story, and let's go all the way back, in a sense, to just shortly after the beginning of time, after that Cain rises up and kills his brother Abel, and then we start marching on through like the fourth and the fifth chapter of the book of Genesis, and how remarkable it is, how fast that things kind of began to go downhill after that sin had entered into the garden so long ago. And so we find that there was a man who walked with God, and these scriptures will not be up there. There was a man who walked with God who was the seventh descendant from Adam, and his name was Enoch. And Enoch, it says, lived 365 years, and he walked with God, and then he was not because God took him. So in other words, Enoch was that person who walked with God by faith, believing that what had been orally transmitted down to him from his lineage, from Adam all the way down to Enoch, he had believed the oratory reports because there were no written scrolls of God at that time, but he had believed and was walking in the light of the wisdom that was given to him by his ancestors so that he might walk with God. And God then took Enoch, in other words, means that he snatched him away and he was not because he was walking by faith, at least in what he knew at that point. And then we know that God judged the world and he brought a flood upon the world. And then after the flood, and we begin to see Noah and his family and his sons, uh, Japheth, Shem, and uh, Ham, yes, thank you. Ham come out of the ark, and then all of the descendants spread to all of the world, and they become the table of 70 nations. And then it tells us that these 70 nations had somewhat gathered in a central place, instead of going to all of the world like God wanted them to do, and they had decided among themselves that they were going to create their own way to God. And so they began to create this Tower of Babel, if you will, that was going to be their own way of being able to reach God and somehow be transformed by their own works and by their own hands. 
And God didn't like that idea too well because it didn't match with his design of the just shall walk by faith. And so God came down and he confused the language of the whole world at that time, kind of made a mockery of the Tower of Babel that they had built. And then he began a process of working through people to bring about his purpose and his plan on the face of this earth. And so he found a man who was living amongst all of these people who were, in, in a sense, settled in this land or this, this valley of Shinar. And this valley of Shinar is where the city of Babylon was. And Ur was like a, uh, a, uh, a, a suburb of, uh, of Babylon, just as uh, Waterford and Pontiac are suburbs in the sense of Detroit. And for those of us who are for uh, my way, Burton is a suburb of Flint. And so this Ur of Chaldees in which Abram at that time and his father were all dwelling in was the place where God begins to call Abram out of unto himself. And so Abram is no different than what you and I and the rest of the world find ourselves in before God finally speaks to our lives and calls us to come out from among wherever that we are and to separate ourselves from where we are and separate ourselves unto God that God then might begin the work of making us right with him by faith and justifying us so that he can begin the process of working out his salvation in each and every one of us. So Abram is that example of God doing this way back in the beginnings of Genesis. And so as we look at chapter 11 and some other uh, passages, and we're going to look first of all at Genesis 12 and then kind of back up a little bit. So Genesis 12, 1 through 5, and these will be up there. Mm -mm. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country and from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Isn't that good news? Amen. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now this is speaking specifically to uh, Abram would be the father of the nation of Israel. And so out of Abram's loins, or his name is later changed to Abraham, then we know that he will give birth to Isaac and then to Jacob, and Jacob's name is changed to Israel. So Abram is the great grandfather of the nation of Israel, but the Bible tells you and I that he's also the father of faith. In other words, Abraham, who had believed in God after the flood, becomes the example for all of the rest of us. So if we come to faith, then we are counted righteous along with faithful Abraham, who had first believed God, and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. Amen? So Abram departed, verse 4, as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Now, I want you to understand something here. He's probably a lot younger when he's first called. We don't know exactly what his age might have been. But we know that God spoke to Abram specifically, it tells us later in the New Testament, and they called him out of Ur of Chaldee. And so Terran, his dad, and the rest of the family began to make their journey to the place that God would show unto them, which we know now would be the land of Canaan, or the promised land of God. But they got sidetracked. And they ended up in Haran. And Haran was in Turkey. So they got about 700 miles into their 1,200 mile journey, and then all of a sudden, they stopped. They didn't go on to the land of Canaan. And they stayed there for at least five years. Now some biblical commentators and others, and I don't know if they're right or not, because we can't read into something that the Bible doesn't tell us. We can only assume some things and think, well, we don't know the answer to that. But here's what we do know. Tehran dies in Haran. So did he get sick or come down with some disease on the 700-mile journey 
and it took him about five years to actually die, and then after he died, then God renewed his call upon Abram, and he said, now get out of there and come on to the place that I originally called you to. And so Abram then eventually makes the journey on down into the land of Canaan. And it says that then Abram took Sarai, his wife, Lot, his brother's son, and all of their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan, and so they came to the land of Canaan. And then in Genesis 15, verses 1 through 6, it says that after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram, for I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing that I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who comes from your own body will be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Now look towards heaven and count the stars, if you are able to number them. Anybody count the stars? There's a lot. I know I can. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord accounted it to him for righteousness. See, God spoke, told him the truth, and Abraham believed it, and God accounted it unto him to righteousness. Do you see how simple that is? But that don't require no effort from me. And I like to be a participant. Right? And so we have trouble with that, don't we? Everybody from the existence of the world has had trouble with that thing. Right? It can't be that easy. Just believe what you say, and I'm righteous with you, and I'm just, and that begins the process of working everything that you set out. Yes, says God. And we go, but, but, don't I got to do something? Yeah, you got to believe. You got to have faith. Right? The just shall walk or live by faith. Amen? Listen to what Joshua says, and I don't think this is on the board. Joshua 24, 2 through, through, 2 through 3, excuse me, says this. And Joshua said to the people, he's reminiscing about the past. He says, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. What? Then I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river, and I led him throughout all of the land of Canaan, and I multiplied his descendants, and I gave him Isaac. You see what God is saying? When I called Abram, as his name was then, he was in Ur of Chaldees, which was in Babylon, which meant that he was a part of the Babylonian system, or what is known today as the world system, right? The world systems of there's all kinds of gods. There's a god of this, and there's a god of that, and there's a god over this, and there's a god over that. And all of Babylon believed in all of these false gods, and guess what? So did Terah, and so did Abram. He's no different than you and I. We all started in idolatry. Even if the only God we were serving was the God of self, we were still in idolatry. And God is calling us out of that idolatry unto the truth of who He is and what only He can do by faith. Amen? Listen to what Isaiah says in 51 verses 1 through 2. Listen to me, you who follow after righteousness. He's talking to the nation of Israel at this point. You who seek the Lord. Anybody seeking the Lord today? Amen. You who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn. And to the hole of the pit from which you were dug. In other words, he's telling Israel, who's now gone back into idolatry, don't you remember your roots? Don't you remember your father Abraham? 
Don't you remember how he believed God and it was accounted unto him the righteousness? How can you leave that and go back to what didn't work to begin with, which God had called him out of? But we do the same thing, don't we? We make a start with God and then somewhere we find ourselves back where we were. And we're stumbling and, and we're trying and, and we're striving and, and we're trying to do this and we're trying to do that to please God. And, and we get caught up then in this performance thing where we're trying to do perform good acts and good works so that God will be pleased with what we do. And God says, I love you just like you are. All I want you to do is believe me. And I'll account that to you as righteousness. You don't need to do all of this other stuff. But we do also have to understand that faith without the works that come by faith is dead. But there's a difference between me trying to do something to please God and me doing what God said, which will please God. Mm -hmm. Amen? If you don't know the difference between the two, then you've got a little growing to do. You've got a little growing up and maturing to do in your faith. Amen? Now listen to what Paul who once was Saul, and in the same form of idolatry, or a little different form of idolatry, when he was Saul, and then his name was changed when he was separated unto God on a road to Damascus. God separated Paul from the world unto himself by knocking him off of his high religious horse and saying, why are you persecuting me, Saul? That ever happened to you? God knocks you off of your high religious horse? And says, wake up. Right? It's a wake up call from God. Paul says it like this. For the love of Christ compels us. Because we judge that if one died for all, then all died. What are you talking about, Willis? What are you supposed to do with that? What do you mean, all died? And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves. But for him who died for them and rose again. Say to someone seated beside you that you're not your own. You're not your own. You're not your own. You've been bought. You've been bought. With a price. With a price. Therefore, Therefore. Glorify, God glorify God in your body. Your body. Because you are not your own. You're not your own. You can't live the self-life any longer. Can't live the self-life any longer. God has called you out. God has called you out. And separated you from that. Amen. Amen. Therefore, Paul says in verse 16, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. There are some people who know me and know who I once was. And know what God called me out of? My wife, Darina, knows because I've shared these stories with her, though she doesn't know all of them, like someone who grew up with me, right? But you know what? They knew me after the flesh. And guess what? That man is not alive any longer. Amen. That man died with Christ. And when he spoke to me, he made me a new creation in Christ Jesus. And now, it doesn't yet appear what I will be, but I keep moving towards that. Amen? Amen. I haven't got there yet, but I'm no longer the dead Daryl that once was alive. Amen? Because he's dead. And you can't resurrect that dead. Amen? Because that's crucified with Christ. The resurrection is those of us who are dead in our trespasses and sins are resurrected to life in Christ through faith. Amen? Amen. For even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, look at Christ's own brothers. They knew who he was according to the flesh because, hey, bro. <laughs> and then he said, but I'm God in the flesh. And they went, yeah, right. <laughs> The whole world is that. So we know who you are. You're Joseph's son, the carpenter. They knew him after the flesh. And we sometimes know others after the flesh. And then they come to the Lord, and guess what we struggle with? We still know him after the flesh. And we can't see 
that they're now a new spiritual being in Christ and it does not yet appear what they're going to be, but they're no longer who they were. That's the transforming power of the Word of God. Amen? We're no longer who we were. We're no longer where we were. We're now a new creation and we're in a new place and we have a new purpose and God has a new plan for our life. Amen? Therefore, verse 17 says, if anyone is in Christ, are you in Christ? In Christ. Then this applies to you. <laughs> he is a new creation. All things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. Isn't that good news? Amen. That's something to shout about, ain't it? Because I no longer have to strive and struggle trying to come up with something that I can do performing to please God. All i got to do is do what he said, and he is pleased. And then I can hear the same thing that Jesus heard when he was baptized at the river, when God opened up the heavens and said, This is my beloved Son, and in him I am well pleased. You know what, folks? Saints? We need to hear that. We need to hear that God is opening up the heavens for you and I, and he's saying... You are my beloved child and I am pleased with you. Why? Because you believe. Because you're a child of faith. A new creation in faith. And if you're not, then you're not His. But if you are, He's pleased with you. You might not be doing all of the things that you could be doing, but that's not what He's looking at. He's looking at the fact that you are in Christ. And that he's pleased with you because you are in Christ. Because he's pleased with Christ. And if he's pleased with the one you're in, don't you think he's also pleased with the one who's in him? Makes sense, doesn't it? Listen to this. The 1,200 mile journey from earth to the promised land reveals to you and I that we must make a clean break from where we are and the difficulty of leaving what we were to what God has called us to, to be people of faith. And just like Abram, we might get stuck along the way. We might get snared along the way. We might start listening to someone who doesn't have our best interest at heart. And they might convince us instead of being where God has called us to be, or answering God's call upon our life, that we're going to be where they want us to be. That's what happened to Abram. He listened to Terah, his father. And his father said, follow me. And Abram followed him. Because in that day, not to be subject to your father was to be a disgrace. And so even though God, who called him, would eventually be his father, he hadn't yet come to that place where God was his father. He still saw his earthly father as the one that he was under authority to. So once Terah died in Haran, God said, now I'm your father. Now listen to me. Right? And the moment that you and I were born again, that's what God said to each and every one of us. Now I'm your father. Listen to me. If you listen to me, I'll set you free. If you listen to some other voice, you'll still be in bondage. Amen? Amen? Habakkuk 2.4 says it like this. Behold the proud. Pride is always the downfall, isn't it? His soul is not upright within him, but the just shall live by faith. And then Romans 1.8, as we bring this plane in for a landing. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to start with unpacking the condemnation of everyone. First, the condemnation of the really bad sinners. We all know who they are. It's easy to point them out, right? They're condemned. But then he changes, he says, but the moral person person who thinks, well, I'm pretty good. I, I do a lot of good stuff. I'm a pretty good guy. Pretty good person. The moral person's also condemned. 
And then it goes on, and Paul shows that even the Jews who were God's called and chosen people are condemned before him because they're coming by it by a different way. And that all of the world is condemned. But then the good news is, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Amen? Amen. And that's where we're going in the weeks ahead. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Everybody wants to talk about the end times today. What are the end times? What is the time when the first of the seven seals is peeled off and we begin into this process of the wrath of God being poured out upon the world? It's the wrath of God against ungodliness. It's the wrath of God against disbelief, doubt, and everything else. Those who are trying to come by some other way, and those who say there's no way anyway. The wrath of God will be poured out. Will there be no hope for people during that time? Absolutely not. There will be all kinds of hope. Because God's word will still be revealed. There will still be one of the greatest revivals that's ever been seen in the nation or in the world up to that point. There will be multitudes that will come to Christ the moment that we leave and are out of here. Because you know why? They're going to go, well, they were right all along. <laughs> They're gone. They were right. What do we do now? And they're going to turn to Christ. They won't realize how difficult it will be because of the Antichrist who's on the scene at that point. But they will learn. Listen to Galatians 3.11. So it is clear. I hope it's clear to you this morning. Because Paul said, it is clear that no one can be made right by, with God by trying to keep the law. No one. For the scripture says it is through faith that a righteous person has life. So if you're still trying to keep the law, perform works to please God, guess what? You're still condemned. But you can be set free. Amen. Here's the point of all of this today. Grace reigns through righteousness, which is received by faith. Romans 5.21 says it like this. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Death had reigned and continues to reign for everyone who is not under grace. But when grace reigns through righteousness, you're not only set free, but you're allowed to become all that you were meant to be by the power of God. There are no longer any shackles on you. We sang about it this morning. My chains are gone. I've been set free. And then, closing with this final verse. Hebrews 10.38 I want you to hear this as the final word from God this morning. Starting in 2020, we became a fearful people who let fear control us and not faith. I want you to hear what God says about that in Hebrews 10.38. But my righteous one, point to your neighbor and say, you are a righteous one. But my righteous one will live by works. No. No, heavens no. My righteous one will live by faith. My righteous one will live by fear. Heaven forbid. My righteous one will live by faith. But if he shrinks back, what? But if he shrinks back and stops walking by faith and starts walking in fear, my soul will have no pleasure in him. Ouch! Ouch! That hurts, doesn't it? 
God says you must walk by faith even when the world wants to control you by fear. Walk by faith. Even if the world says, if you don't stop walking by faith, I'm going to kill you. Say, go ahead. You can't kill me. If you take my physical life, I'm going to be with Jesus. Amen. So why do why would I fear what you can do to me? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when, when they wanted to try to get them to submit to fear and to the control of the false gods, they said, you know what, we're going to fire up the fiery furnace seven times hotter than normal, and unless you renounce your faith in Christ, we're throwing you into the fire. Friends, that's the day and age which we're living in right now. The world is stoking up the fire seven times hotter than it's ever been. And they're saying, if you don't stop talking about Jesus, we're going to throw you into the fire. We're not going to let you buy anything anymore. We're not going to let you do commerce. If you don't stop talking about this Jesus and walking by faith. This pastor wants it to be known, you can kill me, but you can't shut me up. Because I'm going to continue to preach the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ until he calls me home. Amen. Or somebody sends me there. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And I really don't care which one. Amen. Amen? But my righteous one will live by faith. Let's take that to heart this morning, saints. And let's get up out of our seats and let's walk by faith and throw fear to the wind. Amen? There's nothing that this world can do to you that God hasn't already seen. Amen? Mm -hmm. And He is able to keep you by the power of His hand. Amen. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for allowing this, Your servant, to proclaim it this morning. Thank You for giving us ears to hear. And thank You for what You're going to do with it by the power of God now. To give all the praise and honor and glory to you in the name of Jesus. We're not going to have a closing song. I don't know if Jason's already on his way to the platform or not. We'll close right there because I went a little long. Let me leave you with this. The Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face, his favor, to shine upon you this week. May he turn his face towards you and give you all that he has planned for you. Amen. Amen. And may you walk by faith this week so God can unfold and unveil His will, His purpose for your life. And if you are stuck in Haran, may you get up out of there and may you come to the promise of God because that's where you're going to flourish is in His promise. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful day. Amen.